local, regional, and global challenges. Uh, this uh, particular uh, Congress happens once in four years. And the first one was held in China. Uh, that was in 2018 in Beijing. And uh, India is uh, hosting the second uh, Congress in uh, Hyderabad during uh, 10th October to 14th October. So now what is that uh, being planned is uh, across India, there are seven, eight places where in the, the uh, state councils and the state uh, remote sensing center are working with uh, different groups, that is uh, governments, uh, industries, and uh, research and academia. It could be youth and it could be civil society. There are uh, several verticals here. So we're trying to work with all of them and trying to bring out what is that is vibrant in the Indian geospatial ecosystem that could be showcased to the world? That's the main issue. See, what is it we are doing better? And fortunately for us, ISRO being here, it also adds weight to the geospatial ecosystem. And fortunately for us, uh, the government of Karnataka has many first to its uh, uh, credit. One is uh, uh, having a geospatial data center called anonymous in every district of the state, which actually provides GIS applications to the line departments. And we also have the state remote sensing center, which provides and updates data, collects, collates, updates, sometimes generates the data. And now we can also, the micro level data sets are also available, assets data sets are also available. Uh, they have built several applications and programs, which is doing quite well. And first time in Karnataka, we also started the data monetization, which again is the initiative of uh, state government, specifically Dr. Shalvin Rajesh. She is spearheading that. Wherein the data monetization, we're trying to work with private partners in a cloud platform, wherein the government data and the private data sits the same platform, and people can build applications. And also the government or all stakeholders can <coughs> get benefit out of it. Now, as part of uh, this event, uh, we completed the uh, three sessions yesterday. That's uh, common sector, basically what is that we do. That was discussed. Uh, keynote address was given by Dr. Charlie Rajinsh, followed up by the expert from uh, State Remote Sensing Center. Then uh, Dr. Rajan IFS is from KSNDMC. I think uh, all of you might know that KSNDMC is the only agency in the uh, in our country which is providing uh, weather services at the level of gram panchayats. I mean, uh, it's totally micro level because in other states you have a telemetric grain gauges maybe to the extent of 500 square kilometer for one gauge for 500 square kilometer. But case in DMC has, I mean, approximately 20 to 25 square kilometer. And I think. Uh, all other states are looking at case in DMC to replicate their model. So now coming to this today's, then afterwards we had this uh, industry session wherein, uh, including Map India, Hexagon, ESRI, Faro, all of them participated. And in uh, we had a session of uh, uh, research in academia wherein uh, we invited experts from Indian Institute of Science and also. Uh, from institutions like Bangalore University and RDPR Gadag University. Then we also have a representative uh, a faculty from uh, uh, VTU. So it went well and uh, we arrived at some conclusions and we also have drafting something so that uh, some of these highlights or some of these uh, interesting things could be showcased in the main event in Hyderabad. So we will go into uh, bring a white paper on these two-day activities. And once it is done, we submit it to the uh, UNWJIC and uh, one of them or few of them from Karnataka will represent this thing, make a presentation and what is good. And there will be a discussion on everything. So the discussion could go a long way there also. And we can also learn from what the EN countries are doing and what is that we can uh, uh, get from them and integrate with our data sets. And today we have the youth sector, basically we have invited uh, the startups and we believe that uh, some of them are past 10 years, it's no longer a startup. However, I think we we'll listen to them, their expertise, experience working with the uh, government, non-government sector. 
and what is that they want in the geospatial arena where they'll have a much better positions in uh, extending their services. And next thing, we'll have a civil society wherein uh, we have the art of living uh, representative, that is the director, Lingaraju, will be speaking on that. And we also, from civil society, Dr. Sudhira, who is the director of Gupi Labs, will also be speaking. Then uh, the last speaker will be Janagraha Center for Citizenship and Democracy. And under the youth, we have the Omega Analytics Private Limited, Geocentroid, RO One Man System Informatics. There are many such startups or uh, six night companies, but uh, we couldn't invite because of the paucity of time. And not all of them do respond also. Uh, now, I think uh, uh, I made my uh, points uh, clear for what is that expected from this pre event and how this pre event thing can take us forward in the uh, main event that's going to happen in October. That's the main UNWJS event. And uh, we request all of you to participate in that event as well. And now I request uh, my colleagues, Ms. Ramya, Anusha, and Dr. Harish to take it forward, introducing the, they'll begin with the introduction of the uh, speaker and the speaker will have some time, 15 to 20 minutes. Then probably at the end, we'll have a discussion and conclude. Uh, over to you, Rami. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, very, good, very good morning to one and all. I take this opportunity to welcome all to the second day of free events of second UNWGIC. Now I invite the first speaker of today's event, Mr. V. Vijay, founder and director of Omega Analytics Private Limited. He completed a B.Tech in IIT Bombay, postgraduate diploma in management, IIM Bangalore, MSc in finance at Glasgow, UK. He has an experience on digital terrain modeling and geospatial analytics for track alignment design and bridge hydraulic investigations in Indian railways and transportation of water resources sectors geographical information systems, and remote sensing technologies. He successfully completed feasibility studies and surveys for over 3,000 kilometers of new roads and railways, including most challenging projects in Arunachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, and Western Ghats. His experience spans credit and equity research, investment management, banking software, and financial risk analysis. Uh, over to you, sir. I request Mr. Vijayvi. Yes. Uh, good, good morning. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. You are audible. Sir. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here this morning. Uh, my very thanks, heartfelt thanks to KCST and uh, Jamal Kumar and, and others, and also from our friends from, from the geospatial community uh, who have joined us this morning. Uh, I have a, a brief presentation. I will keep it uh, within about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I'll be sharing some slides uh, which will sort of give you a flavor of the work that we have done. Uh, in this field over the last uh, several years. And I also sort of share some of my thoughts as to what uh, we should be actually doing uh, in the future. So I just move on to my uh, slide presentation. Would you be able to see the slides please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Please make it full yeah. screen. Yeah. I'll share the full screen. Yes. Okay. One second. Uh, so I have titled my uh, presentation today. Uh, and the theme is on eliminating time and cost overruns in linear infrastructure projects. Uh, so while the broader theme is about, uh, about the world being a global village, well, that is certainly true of, uh, of information uh, and information technology and information access uh, because of the fantastic growth in, uh, in wireless networks and the smartphones over the last uh, two decades. But the same uh, is not something that we could say about physical connectivity. So I think physical connectivity still lags behind. And I would like to sort of highlight some of the problems and the challenges in developing you know, uh, the physical connectivity network. And my focus will be primarily on 
on rail and highway where we have most of our prior experience in. So just to set the context right, we all know the, uh, the, uh, the quantum of investment that is actually going into the uh, infrastructure sector, uh, the transportation infrastructure sector, it, it runs into, into billions and even trillions of dollars. Now, uh, but yet I think uh, we're all aware about the challenges because you know, we read about it and we also see some of the challenges uh, as we drive around or as we travel around the country. And that is to do with one is infrastructure projects uh, have huge time and cost overruns. They don't get completed on time. They are all well above budget. Uh, there are other, other problems as well. I mean, it's to do with the quality of the infrastructure. I mean, is it really, is it really satisfactory? Are we happy with the quality of the infrastructure? And two, there are also safety aspects as well. You know, uh, we have, uh, worryingly, we have a poor road safety record. Uh, and many of these uh, challenges need to be addressed. So there have been reports uh, from, from, from the government itself about uh, some of the problems that we are facing in the infrastructure sector, and I've just highlighted, uh, made a few points, uh, quoted a few points from the uh, from the government in, ter in terms of uh, what's actually happening on border infrastructure, because that's very representative of the challenges that we face, and equally where geospatial technologies can have a huge impact. Uh, so a lot of our border roads uh, are, are behind schedule. Uh, the same is true for some of our strategic railway lines. Uh, and there have also been comments about uh, the unsatisfactory quality of perhaps the roads, the gradients not being right or the turning radius not being adequate and so on. So, uh, so many of these things have a direct uh, impact on uh, uh, not just on, on, the, uh, on the costs and time overruns, but in a, con in a country like India, especially given the current environment, there's also a national security aspect that needs to be addressed. And therefore, defense preparedness and so on are, are key issues which concern the government. And infrastructure has had has a huge role to play there. Uh, now, it's very clear that uh, it's it's a well recognized fact that in the in infrastructure, the uh, most of, or it's true for any manufacturing industry, probably true for software development as well, that most of the costs are largely decided uh, during the planning and design phase. Uh, so, how good your plan is and how good your designs are in a sense determines uh, the future path and progress of the project itself. So both, uh, both the construction uh, as well as you know, the operations and maintenance periods that uh, subsequent to it. Uh, now, uh, it's in the infrastructure sector, in, in, uh, in uh, civil infrastructure and heavy construction, uh, we, are, we, have, we have seen changes, we have seen progress. I think we are using more modern construction methods uh, but it's our view that uh, the planning and design methods have really have not changed very much. Uh, and that's where a lot that we can actually do uh, to improve the quality of the uh, of our designs. And now, in the specific context of linear projects like roads and, and railways, uh, the single most important uh, design issue is that of route selection. So essentially, I need to connect two points, right? Uh, say two towns or two villages, A and B. Uh, what's the best route? for my road or railway line between those two points. Now, it's very clear and it's uh, based on experience as well, and there's a lot of data to support it, that no other state of the, no other stage of, of, of the project has a greater influence than, than the route itself. Uh, and if there are mistakes or if it's uh, unsatisfactory, it's almost impossible to rectify. So in manufacturing or software, you know, you could have bugs, you could, I mean, you could have bug fixes, you could have, you could recall products, but in heavy infrastructure, there is, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Once, they, once it's constructed, uh, you know, one has to live with the consequences of that uh, for generations. So, which is why it makes it exceedingly important to get it right the first time. Let me just illustrate this uh, with a project that we did for the railways uh, in the Northeast. Uh, this is actually uh, a line that the government has been planning to connect uh, Tawang. Uh, which is uh, near the China border. And this is uh, largely meant to be a strategic railway line uh, to be used by our defense uh, personnel. Now, uh, the challenge here was that we need to connect Balukpong, which, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I hope you're able to see that on the Google image that I, that I have, uh, I have uh, which is at a level of about 170 meters above sea level to Tenga Valley, which is about 1,400 meters. So this is part of the uh, Balukpong uh, Tawang line. So this is one section of it. The entire line may be about 200 kilometers, but this is the first 100 kilometers that was being planned for. 
So Tenga is an isn't like an obligatory point that we need to connect uh, on the way to to Tawang. Now this is a problem that has been uh, uh, for which the railways and even the uh, armed forces have been concerned with for, for several years to come up with an appropriate uh, route. So we are still at the at the early stages, still at the design stages, and it's, it's obviously very very far away from seeing uh, this completed. But nevertheless, uh, let me just highlight some of the design challenges. So we need to connect point A to point B, Balukpang to Tenga. There are two different uh, levels. Uh, now there are other constraints, right? Because uh, this several uh, the alignment has to cross several mountain ranges. So there will be extensive tunneling, but at the same time we want to reduce uh, the uh, tunnel links to the extent possible because if tunnel links are very long. We have to provide for you know escape tunnels and so on from a, from a safety perspective, so which increases the cost of the project. Uh, railway lines like roads and uh, you know they have curvature and gradient constraints. We can't have very steep gradients. Now can we have sharp curves? Uh, equally uh, important is the fact that we have to locate stations because we have a single line between A and B, right? The, we need crossing stations so that trains from opposite directions can cross over. So finding uh, you know, and these stations, crossing stations have to be located about 10 to 15 kilometers apart. Uh, okay, so, so as to improve the capacity of the line. So it is no easy task to find even an appropriate location for a station because, uh, you know, because the stations can't be underground for operational reasons. So we need open to sky stations uh, and the gradients have to be very flat within the station itself. Otherwise it, it causes other operational uh, challenges. So the yards have their own gradients, and even the tunnels, for example, you, you like, uh, from a constructability perspective, you like to have it as straight as possible. So there are very demanding engineering requirements uh, for a railway line, and uh, this is why it's taken a long time for uh, the government to even come up with, uh, for the railways, and uh, to come up with uh, you know, satisfactory proposals. Uh, so this is uh, because we were aware, we were first introduced to the problem almost about uh, in around 2013. And when the railways were, was grappling with this problem, and they finally came back to us around 2017 to see whether we had, uh, you know, we could do better than what they had. Uh, and I, actually, it was actually possible for us using geospatial technologies, and I'll try to highlight that, uh, you know, uh, as we go along, uh, that you know the the proposals that the railways initially had involved, uh, you know, bridges of height of almost 100 meters. So if you see this image on the bottom right of the screen, you see these high viaducts. Right, which is you now once you have higher viaducts, you need to have very deep foundations, and there are other uh, issues as well. You know because you have to look at uh, you know the seismic risks, uh, and many of these uh, some some of these uh, viaducts are actually on sharp curves, so there are no standard railway designs for bridges of this kind. So it will take several years, uh, even for to develop designs for high viaducts like these because these are non-standard designs, and it will take even more time to get approvals for this. So these are some of the challenges and also uh, the extensive tunneling requirement. The longest tunnels were of the order of about 11 to 12 kilometers. Uh, so this was the proposals that the, that the railways had over, over the years uh, of, of improvement until they sort of approached us. And uh, in a space of about uh, just about two, two to three weeks, right, we were able to come up with an alternative, uh, which was you know, superior on, in, in all aspects the highest bridge that in our which is required in our the other proposal was just about 20 meters as compared to 100 meters in the railways proposal and even the tunnel lengths were, were reduced uh, not entirely but uh, significant, significantly enough uh, and a very important aspect has been that the stations that we were proposing the station locations that we were proposing were all open to sky whereas the earlier proposals had you know stations underground so this was extremely well received uh, uh, by the railways uh, and uh, you know we had commendations from the concerned chief engineer as well. Uh, the interesting thing is it's a very non-intuitive route. And essentially, the point it's uh, we essentially we need to, need to travel north uh, north northwest from uh, Balukpong to to Tawang uh, to to Tenga. But the route that we were able to propose was something which is non-intuitive, right? You can see from the alignment itself, it goes first to due west and then takes almost like a, a U-turn and then uh, comes back and then heads north. So this was something that would be very hard to do using conventional uh, uh, techniques. And I'll just come, uh, I'll sort of quickly contrast the conventional way of doing it and how GIS actually helps uh, in solving problems like this. Uh, very quickly, I'll just go on. Now there are similar problems in the highway sector as well, right? So these are actually border roads that uh, we have worked on uh, for, uh, in, in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, both near the China border as well as the, uh, near the Burma border. 
and many of these projects were actually held up for years you know for the because uh, there was no there was no satisfactory alignment that uh, that was proposed and uh, the other way of doing it is uh, to use the conventional way of doing it is to use uh, contour maps or go to the ground and many of these things are not feasible and because they're all uh, they got border areas they're sensitive areas so you know you don't get permissions easily to, to survey from the ground so uh, this was when we were approached by the the consultants working in this area and again in the sp space of about uh, three months we were able to propose solutions uh, propose solutions uh, alignments for almost about 300 kilometers of road uh, in a space of about uh, as i said about 45 days to uh, uh, 40 to 45 to 50 days so here again there are challenges in roads uh, right it's uh, one is certainly the gradients there are we have to locate where the hairpin bends are right uh, the appropriate locations for the hairpin bends which which are necessarily part of the uh, of the alignment and equally the mountain passes because we have when we go from one mountain to another right we don't descend to the bottom of a mountain and climb the other now we look for for passes so that we can go from one to the other so you know the contour pattern and so on becomes important in locating the ideal uh, mountain pass to go from one section to the other so this again uh, i just spent just a, less than a minute on this slide but it just gives you you know you can see the twists and turns that the road actually takes uh, and uh, these are all mountainous areas uh, and uh, okay the alignment is one we have to be uh, mindful of the uh, environmental impact of some of the roads because they will necessarily involve deep cuttings so things like slope stability becomes important drainage becomes exceedingly important uh, we sometimes have to go through forest areas you know we have to minimize minimize uh, the environmental impact of our work so there are in all these uh, uh, problems there are uh, root uh, problems there are engineering constraints there are environmental constraints and there are economic constraints uh, now coming to very quickly as to what the you know the conventional method is uh, is to use uh, contour maps uh, topo sheets 150000 scale 20 meter contour interval many of these things are completely inadequate and especially in uh, in uh, the sensitive border areas some of these topo sheets are not even available so we have had to use open source data uh, to begin with uh, use uh, terrain models from that uh, and because we are able to opt, uh, in a sense automate a fair bit of the of the route alignment we are able to uh, able to provide many more options and as i showed you in the case of the uh, uh, the strategic railway line some of these options are fairly non intuitive so uh, so automation and so when we say automation obviously we can't work with uh, with paper maps we we need to have digital data and uh, you know in a sense and uh, we're it's basically a search we are searching for a path so the, the the quality of the algorithm becomes important whether we search in a sense what is the search radius when we look for a path what's the search radius so there are issues uh, there are you know algorithmic issues also that, that we have to factor in uh, and then there's a lot of other data that we need to integrate. We need to integrate topographic data, soil data, drainage data, and so on. So many of these things are impossible to do in uh, the conventional method. Uh, so GIS uh, provides a, a fantastic platform in which to integrate these different data layers and to give all stakeholders a correct perspective as to what the challenges are. Uh, the next kind of problem that we work on quite extensively is in the area of hydrology and uh, bridge hydraulic safety designs. The picture you see here is actually of a, a near fatal railway accident on the Bangalore Chennai line uh, almost 15 years ago. Uh, a bridge was just washed away. I mean, there was no real recent history of flooding of this kind. But uh, in a flash flood, there were breaches of tanks in the catchment area. Uh, and then there was this flash flood which washed away the, uh, the embankment and also the, the, the piers. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was an alert person who sort of noticed that and he was able to bring the uh, trained to a slow halt, uh, which is what, which way the casualties were avoided. So this is a very important consideration in any, any highway or railway design. The what we call as the waterway calculations, right? We have to estimate catchment areas. We have to estimate slopes. We have to estimate flow velocities, uh, flow depths, and so on. Uh, so GIS has uh, obviously a huge role in in this. So there again, the conventional way of doing it uh, of demarcating. Topo sheets, uh, catchment areas, and topo sheets, and so on is cumbersome. It's uh, prone to error, and people with that kind of experience are also over a period of time they are retired. So you know, there is a need for us to bring for geospatial community to bring these kind of solutions to the railways. Uh, the, the picture at the bottom right again shows what actually happened in in Bihar. In Bihar in 2017, floods 
affected. I think most of the railway lines were affected for almost about three to four months, uh, three to four weeks before they could be restored. And uh, we were actually called in to sort of look at alternative sites to put additional bridges so that, you know, to minimize the effect of floods uh, in future. So as I said, uh, so the catchment area is one portion, a central hydrological report will have, you know, we have to look at, uh, you know, hydrographs, we look at, uh, you know, synthetic hydrographs, we look at rainfall patterns, look at 50 year rainfall histories, uh, and then come up with that and then look at, once we know the cross section of the, of the river channel at the bridge site, we have to, once we know what kind of, what is the design discharge that it's rooted to that cross section, we have to estimate the flow velocities and as well as the, uh, flow depths. So all these are very important ingredients in the design of the railway line in planning the, uh, in both the planning in, in both the plan as well as the longitudinal section of the railways, of the, of the new, new line. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly summarize uh, what our experience has been. Uh, so it's really our view uh, and our suggestion that we must reimagine the pre-construction functions when we design linear projects by Reconstruction, I largely mean the planning and the design functions. And more at, even at a conceptual level, there's a huge amount of improvement that needs to be brought. And as I've shown earlier, and as I spoke earlier, right, if we do the uh, preliminary activities well, in a sense, the chances, the probability that you will have a satisfactory result uh, is much, much higher. And it costs very less. It doesn't cost much, right? It, it, it doesn't cost much to make design changes, but it makes, it costs a hell of a lot to make changes during construction or uh, during operation and maintenance. Um, so the other uh, suggestion that we have is, you know, we must uh, pay more attention, attention to building GIS systems, data needs to be organized. Uh, we can't have disparate data sources because uh, especially in these kind of projects, as I said, there are hydrological data, there's geological data, uh, there's uh, other road networks, et cetera. All that information has to be brought in when we plan. Route selection is, is undoubtedly the most important design problem. Uh, and our objective should be not just to design one feasible alignment, but we should be looking at optimal alignments. So optimization is important. Not just, so we should be able to have, we need techniques and technologies that provide us with a range of options rather than just one. Uh, the planning methods, you know, we need to have inputs from other stakeholders because these are large projects. It affects uh, a large number of people uh, who live and work and near, the, uh, near these projects. So their requirements uh, and their concerns should also need to be addressed. Uh, we need better systems to learn from, from, from earlier projects, right? Knowledge management is, is crucial. Uh, and very briefly to summarize, uh, uh, it's, it should be obvious to all of us now that the way forward is, 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 is digital. So very briefly about us, we've been in this field for the last uh, uh, almost eight, nine years working in geospatial technologies. So three, as, as was said in the introduction, almost 3,000 kilometers of road and railway line all across the country, starting from uh, our early work in Bangalore, we now have projects across the country uh, and clients who are both in the government as well as in the private sector. Uh, and, uh, you know, our services includes a whole range of geospatial solutions, but uh, for today, I've just focused on two of the important aspects of our work, which is in the early feasibility studies and surveys for new lines and also the hydrological investigations. Okay, so thank you very much, and I hope to be able to ask, answer your questions in, in, or any uh, clarification that you want in due course. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vijay, for a presentation about eliminating time and cost overruns in linear infrastructure and how GIS helps to solve the challenges in transportation network. Once again, thank you, sir, on behalf of KCST. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now we will move on to the next presentation. And I would like to invite Mr. Vinod Kumar P, founder and CEO of Geocentrite Private Limited. He has more than 20 years of experience and he is the leading expert in the field of geospatial technology, reality capture, 3D CAD, and B. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Ramya. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all my friends, uh, geospatial community friends. Uh, first of all, thank you, KSIT, for bring this opportunity for the startup, uh, which uh, really uh, means a lot. Uh, we have been a, a company, uh, we have mainly uh, focused on non-government projects, uh, especially our clients are from uh, UK and USA. 
So I have a more than uh, 20 year experience in the DNC in the geospatial and uh, uh, reality capture field. So today I'm going to uh, discuss more about service, what we offer, and uh, I want to touch a uh, topic of reality capture and transforming all uh, as is basis model to a digital platform, which is we can build that in a building information model, which not only helps to preserve our cultural uh, ancient uh, uh, buildings and uh, sites, archaeological sites, and it also helps to monitor and maintain that in for the future generation. So I will share my screen. Can you able to see the screen? Ah, uh, yes, sir. All right. So about as uh, uh, we are just under uh, private limited. We have been uh, uh, started our company back in 2016. Uh, we still call ourselves as a startup. Uh, we mainly focus on uh, geospatial uh, engineering and BIM related service. We wanted to be in the industry with a comprehensive service provided for the GS and uh, GS and engineering and uh, uh, reality capture as integrated uh, uh, life cycle of the any project uh, in the going forward. So we wanted to be a main uh, limelight. We can support all the parameters of any projects of the entire life cycle. So what do we do? Uh, we mainly have uh, different departments. Uh, we take up uh, geospatial and remote sensing. Mainly in remote sensing, we use the technology uh, photogrammetry and uh, providing orthoposis. The photogrammetry can be uh, from an aerial uh, or captured nadir images or a drone captured images. Now drone, drone has been in a boom and it's been uh, widely used in the industry. Uh, to capture all the information which is uh, uh, geolocated uh, to uh, put into a GIS platform. And we also uh, support our team uh, to uh, do a LIDAR. Uh, we have a, a specialized tool which can capture it as is and uh, real uh, space of the environment which can be uh, converted into an informative model, especially the LIDAR mobile mapping. Uh, we use uh, 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 technology like a static or mobile LIDAR scanner mounted on a vehicle which can travel along the uh, road so which can capture uh, all the uh, surfaces in a uh, point cloud dimensional way where uh, multi-billions of points create a cluster of the model which we use as an engineers to convert that point cloud data into a 3D informative model. And we do also have a UV, UAV data processing analysis and uh, UAV videography and GIS. And our other department, we uh, convert 3D laser scan and beam, which is uh, the main topic which I'm going to touch today. So which can be converted, uh, used in AEC industries, uh, and archaeological department and forestry to, uh, uh, to capture the information in a uh, intelligent way and uh, preserve it uh, in a characteristic way. So that will help uh, engineers as well as uh, planning and uh, department to assess the information uh, of, as is basis in the particular stuff. And we also provide a CAD services uh, where we convert as is uh, basis again uh, to uh, for engineers to provide a floor plan elevation section to see the uh, any uh, existing building and to do the refurbishment and put that uh, into a digital documentary way. So that is very important. Yeah. So today uh, we, we're going to discuss about a uh, transforming reality capture data, which is uh, captured by a laser scanner, a LIDAR, and a photogrammetry, which can be RGB to convert that to 3D and the building information modeling. So uh, when, when, when we talk about reality capture, we have to uh, uh, say what is beam, uh, building information modeling is a, a foundation of transforming uh, the uh, environment into digital. It is mainly uh, widely used in uh, AEC industries. And BIM is a process which can use a lot of technology uh, 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 technologies in, to ensure the planning and uh, design has been put in a collaborative way. Uh, especially we use on the uh, Autodesk application, uh, which is Revit, uh, and which uh, Revit uh, all the exports can be utilized in 3D GIS as well. We can integrate the 3D models delivered from Revit to integrated in our GIS platform as well. So reality capture itself, a, a different domain, people call it in different name, uh, uh, reality capture, and we can convert that scan data, which is captured in reality way from the tools, uh, it can be converted to BIM, building information. And 
which is also called as is basis so we capture the data as is basis which this will be helpful for mainly to document uh, to monitor especially uh, when you come to industrial use uh, uh, this technology or remote sensing technology without touching the object it capture the information so no need to deploy multiple uh, many resources on the hazardous places so all these scanners can gather the information and we uh, engineers sitting at a uh, place with the uh, available tools we convert that into a very informative model so there are three stages uh, in any reality capture uh, collection of data which is a, a main uh, way of uh, uh, gathering information and processing it to an uh, usable data or which can be able to convert that digital transformation and providing 3d model and beam tool so uh, with this slide i'm gonna uh, show that like way of uh, uh, the tools or technology can be able to capture information uh, starting from the drones and the static uh, lidar scanner and uh, a mobile lidar scanner a handheld scanner the technology has been emerged and uh, now the technology is like the drones can carry it by itself and sensors which can capture wide areas can be helpful for uh, conversion and uh, we need to use certain tools to uh, use the data to uh, uh, you know bring it to the real environment to measure the geometry uh, of the any objects so the accuracy uh, depends on the uh, instrument what we use uh, we can uh, uh, quote it from millimeter accuracy when we use high resolution uh, scanners and also we can go to centimeter accuracy when we use the drone stuff and all yeah uh, all the technology has been uh, really widely used because when we capture the uh, terrestrial uh, model we use our static scanner when we want to view the data from the aerial perspective we use the uh, uh, drones and when we are uh, capturing wide areas with a, a prospect view we use a handheld scanners to gather the information so this saves a lot of time for uh, surveyors and uh, this uh, survey done by the instruments are very uh, highly uh, accuracy uh, data which can uh, you know the other application like autodesk and other multiple application are there to collect that point cloud data to a 3d model so what the industries we support uh, we support ac industries and uh, heritage buildings oil and gas and transportation especially infrastructure railway uh, to gather information and provide uh, the information which is uh, used for the cross sectioning on the roads uh, to see the profile of the go, uh, land and and for the cut and fill to de uh, provide a detailed project report for the uh, dpr team so uh, the stand to beam services mainly uh, we uh, especially in uk now uh, no elevation has to be removed or demolished or reconstructed that is uh, the they want to preserve their culture uh, ancient uh, designs and also this technologies has been captured and modeled and that digital document has been kept preserved if any disaster happened any uh, uh, uncertainty happened any building that uh, have been uh, damaged though they can reconstruct it back with the same parameters which have been yeah. built from a as is basis there have been a very strict rule guideline that all the big uh, entire london the front facade could not be you know uh, done any modification and they can only work on the back end of the building with building different uh, structures so that's how the historical building have been maintained when they uh, information has been gathered so uh, here are some of the project which uh, due to uh, timing so i can uh, only present few of the sites and due to a lot of ndas we cannot present the bigger uh, area of the project so if you look at the left hand side of my screen is uh, it is represented by a points that is only a points it's a billions of point collected together that in intensity has been uh, it, we can visualize this look like a real image or anything so that's actually density of the point cloud a cluster of point cloud which can represent in a 3d view so we sitting engineers here we convert that back to on our right hand side the informative model we design and depict all the information to using our autocad tools uh, to it's not only depicting every information gathered has been uh, having a parameter and design so if any uh, you want to replicate this same building in uh, any other location it can be done in a uh, using that design and uh, all information yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, all, all, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, this is again uh, uh, some of the uh, high level accuracy level what we can gather, you can see on my screen, left hand side and uh, right hand side of the print model. So, and also we use similar technologies uh, uh, to do a highway uh, mapping and uh, infrastructure modeling. So all the point load data derived from mobile mapper scanner on the left hand side can be converted back to a different level of uh, detail modeling, providing contours, providing all vector data, providing all uh, road asset data uh, and attributing it into GIS platform, which we have did for multiple projects. We have been provided all the uh, assets, uh, data assets and uh, road furnitures and street furnitures on the platform which can be used to monitor and uh, maintain and uh, uh, they can also uh, divide the entire zone into for, uh, you know, dividing into several engineers to maintain it. And also uh, we will help uh, engineers to see the road profiles. Uh, we can provide a chain edge value of 10 meter, five meter and a contour level of from point one meter to uh, multiple meters as per the client desirable. So again, uh, this is uh, been done by some of the drones, uh, which have been uh, used for power line classification and uh, vectorization. This helps for uh, the, the engineers to you know uh, assess the catenary heights and uh, uh, to, to make sure that uh, what level of sagging has been done in across the period of the different seasons. And these are the few projects which we helped uh, the uh, water and environment team to pre, uh, preserve the uh, record their uh, water uh, areas as well as a bridge modeling which can help them to uh, in, in any future expansion they have to do they will go for this uh, as is basis and they can utilize this data and assess what could be the next level of uh, development need to be done and this are some of the uh, examples of how do we capture the uh, engineering level aspects of MEP details in the building using a uh, uh, reality capture scan data. Uh, if you look at uh, one of the another example, which we converted all the point load or as this basis to a real informative model on the left hand bottom of side of my screen. Yeah, these are the we also do uh, the data uh, which can be uh, PDF. There are uh, there are some of the buildings uh, which have been uh, already in a static uh, documentary, which we convert them back to uh, 3D. And this uh, 3D model will be uh, used for visualization. And they, they can use this uh, historical building to put in a QoS mission so people, and also it can be web hosted. Uh, people can have a virtual tour of it uh, rather than visiting. If they are unable to visit, they can have a virtual tour of it and they can also convert that uh, data into a VR and uh, AR module. So they can feel the real uh, essence of the, uh, they can experience in different way. So yeah, same, we have been again uh, uh, planning to get into a uh, residential manner. We want to, uh, capture all uh, data and give it to the revenue department where they can assess their uh, assets uh, across their uh, uh, geography so they can digitally document for revenue collection stuff and all. We can accurately measure and this also been used in a real estate uh, uh, transaction where buyer and seller need to know uh, accurate uh, corporate area and built up areas. This we measure using a uh, our reality capture and convert that into real, uh, very accurate, uh, informative model for the engineers. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm happy to, uh, I've been rushed a few things. It's very vast domain uh, for starting from photogrammetry to this level. It's we, we as a geocenter are trying to integrate and uh, have a, a service provider for the comprehensive uh, GS uh, related and, uh, but uh, this, Today's topic I wanted to touch uh, reality capture, which we essentially, um, our proposal and ask is that like we can digitally document all the uh, uh, temples here across in uh, Karnataka and then put that into KHGS platform. So uh, any, uh, it will also help for the travel uh, uh, travel department and agency to, you know, encourage uh, people to come over and uh, have a view, real view then as well as digital document review. So thank you very much for MSR also to bringing all uh, startup uh, in this platform. And we definitely want to uh, make sure your event on October will be in a 
a very uh, very uh, intelligent way to move on any help uh, any ask if you have please do not hesitate to let us know that we we, we will happy to help with some of a proof of concept of the project as well for your uh, future uh, event thank you very much thank you. Uh, thank you very much mr vinod for a presentation about building information modeling point cloud data and 3d modeling techniques uh, once again thank you uh, mr vinod on behalf of kacsd uh, now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Abhyudaya Saxena from RF Unmanned Systems. He leads data processing team and is in charge of all project deliveries. He is an aerospace engineer with a master's degree in remote sensing and GIS. He has been working with AUS for the last three years and have handled extensive projects from landscape mapping to mining and agriculture. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning and thank you, uh, Ms. Ramya, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, good morning to all my colleagues and folks here too. Uh, for, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, small series of lectures. So I'll uh, straight away jump into uh, my presentation. Uh, just let me know whenever that is visible. Uh, let me know if you can see the screen. No, sir. I saw it. Visible. Visible. Great. So, okay. So, um, as uh, Mr. Ramya already mentioned, that I represent R01 Man Systems. Uh, we are an end to end uh, service provider and drone manufacturer uh, in the Indian market. We are making drones as per the DDCA requirements. Uh, we have been in the market for the last, uh, you can say, nine years now. And we started off as a startup uh, at uh, in which we were incubated at IIT Kanpur for about two years before, uh, you know, after that we moved to Bangalore and started our operations here. So uh, we have gradually established ourselves as the biggest player in terms of uh, commercial mining, uh, commercial uh, drone applications. Uh, we have, I think, the largest experience in the area mapping in the country. Uh, we do have a lot of large contracts at hand, uh, which enable us to map uh, entire states even. So we have recently got a contract to map the entire state of Haryana uh, for Survey of India. Uh, in terms of the other experience, we have already mapped about 5 million acres of land across India. Uh, we have covered more than 250 mines as of now. Uh, in terms of stockyards, uh, we have covered about 250 plus stockyards. And these are regular deployments where we are mapping on a very, very regular basis, on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis. And uh, about 35 cities is something that we have also mapped for a variety of applications across India. So uh, why are we doing all of this? Uh, again, this uh, we can go back and reference to the kind of data set which is required by uh, the industry. So we are moving towards a GIS data set which is more accurate, which is uh, more reliable, uh, which encompasses a lot of layers or, uh, rather than only talking about 2D. Uh, we are providing 3D data. Uh, like my colleagues mentioned, earlier uh, from Geocentroid and from uh, the Omega Analytics that it is very important to have the right kind of data and right kind of information to build the analytical models. If you don't have the right data, then all the analytics will also not be as efficient. Uh, so uh, we are doing that through use of drones. So we were the first ones to realize that, yeah, I mean, a TPK can be a good solution for uh, drones in the commercial market. And we were the first ones to introduce uh, that in the Indian market also. And uh, since then, we have been enjoying a growth of 250% in revenue uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, currently, we are uh, stationed in Bangalore, although we have our operations all across India. Uh, we, we are about 120-member team, and uh, we project that we're going to be about 200-plus in the next six months. Uh, so not talking about too much of revenue here, but yeah. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, outputs that we provide to the industry uh, are such a way that uh, we uh, we retain our providers for Tata Steel, and uh, in Tata Steel uh, I, I, we have the end-to-end uh, -end contract that all drone operations which are going to happen in Tata Steel are going to be conducted by AUS. In that we are doing the mine surveys on a regular basis. We are doing the data analytics. We are doing change detection, volumetric analysis. Uh, we are doing uh, uh, safety assessment of the mines. Uh, we are doing uh, the project progress monitoring of their plants and other upcoming sites. 
and this has been a three year uh, this commitment that we already have uh, we have been working with them for the past one and a half years also one of the major giants is hindalco this is again the mining sector where we see a very scalable uh, growth uh, we have been working with hindalco for the past four years and the uh, the engagement with hindalco is also almost a similar as what we have with uh, tata the only difference is that uh, we are more concentrating on the mines uh, and the mine analytics here instead of uh, the plants and other uh, requirements so why are we you know uh, what sectors are we in and what kind of data are we providing so we uh, can say that you know uh, our core focus is on four main sectors uh, one is mining uh, large scale infra uh, which includes your highways roads irrigation projects uh, you know then we are in urban and rural planning uh, we are mapping entire cities we are mapping entire rural areas uh, we are one of the largest contributors to the swamitva scheme of the survey of india where we have already mapped about 20000 villages and we are currently working actively in six more states uh, with about 120 drones operational and flying at the moment and then we are also getting into precision farming applications which is something in the making but we are not actually there yet so uh, all these uh, the, the common thing between all these sectors is that they are very very highly scalable and we can uh, either in terms of uh, the areas are large or in terms of uh, the the repeatability of the data which is required so in mining there is a constant change uh, in terms of uh, the terrain so every day a new excavation happens every day uh, the uh, the dump size increases uh, they want to understand what is the volume which is available what is the volume which has moved uh, they want to understand whether their operations are in the safe limits or not and now there is a requirement from the government also uh, that uh, they have to submit plans and charts and their uh, you know their yearly plans based on the drone survey output so this is again i mean uh, this is very helpful for us and uh, we are uh, one of the largest players in this market uh, then in terms of road we are targeting highways irrigation networks so uh, when it comes to let's say planning of irrigation networks or uh, pipe irrigation network or uh, you know uh, canal irrigation network uh, the engineers would like to have a very good understanding of the field they they want to know what their terrain is like they want to know what obstacles or obstructions are there on the field uh, they want to understand the full topography of it uh, with a good accuracy and also very good resolution so uh, this is where again drones come in uh, so earlier it was a myth that drones can be only operated for smaller areas currently we have drones which are capable of mapping about 4500 acres in a single day and uh, you multiply that with about 100 200 drones operational you can estimate that how much area can be mapped uh, using drones in a single day uh, so again uh, these uh, the kind of big projects that we have done for these kind of clients is uh, ranging from about 300 square kilometers to about 1200 1300 square kilometers in a single area so it's a huge i mean uh, uh, the industry is growing the demand is also growing and we are there to support in the urban and rural planning there again is a host of applications that Uh, we we are targeting uh, most of the cities that we have mapped are for property taxation uh, the the uh, the uh, you know uh, managers of the city the, the various departments want to understand what is the floor area ratio uh, what is the encroachment if any in a particular area uh, both horizontal encroachment and vertical encroachment and since we have the 3d data we can provide all these uh, things very easily uh, to the customer and also uh, there are variety of other applications also linked to Uh, mapping of urban and rural areas since we have the 3d data we are we can also very effectively plan utilities if let's say someone wants to have a gas connection or a water pipeline connection uh, we can do very very uh, you know uh, accurate uh, assessments and calculations and prepare dprs based on this data set which is available to us so uh, we are the consumers of this data and also uh, agencies like uh, you know the large dpr agencies or firms which are uh, uh, which specialize in this kind of uh, dpr preparation or design aspects and engineering aspects also use this data apologies for the noise i am sitting very close to an airport so yeah so i mean we are trying to answer these questions uh, effectively using drones so i mean uh, if you're working on a site uh, you would as a manager site manager or as someone in charge of maintaining that site you would, uh, you have so many questions what is the inventory of raw material that i have uh you know it at my site uh who owns the land if i have to expand uh, i mean uh, what is uh, let's say uh, what is the 
uh, you can say, uh, what is the improvement which is required in a particular facility? If it is a road that is going to be constructed, what is the best route for that road? I think this was already covered in one of the earlier presentations. So all this can be done if you have a very high quality and high accuracy data, which is available. So the, the kind of plans and uh, maps that we are providing are highly detailed. They're very, very accurate and uh, they're very relevant to the current use cases. Uh, so uh, if you want to compare it with the traditional approaches, we have satellites, which are, again, if you want to go for uh, very, very high resolution or ultra high resolution, uh, 30 centimeter data sets, these are very expensive and they are not really available for small areas. You have to purchase larger data sets. Uh, the accuracy is also low since you're working with a ground sampling distance of 30 centimeters. Your accuracy is about three times of that in the horizontal and about five times of that in the vertical uh, planes. And uh, then the uh, availability is that, uh, you know, uh, you, the, these are not available readily. You have to purchase and go through a whole process of acquiring that data set. Uh, the next is the manned aircrafts, which, were, which are being used in uh, most of the Western countries. Uh, these are either small planes or helicopters on which these are very expensive cameras are mounted and these are flown. Although they're able to cover larger areas, uh, when it comes to scalability, again, uh, you're restricted by the number of aircrafts that you can operate. Uh, over the long run, the drones become more scalable and uh, the update rate is also roll, uh, low. So let's say if you're working on a mine, you can't fly an aircraft there every day or every week. It becomes very, very expensive. And the third is the manual survey approaches using total station DGPS or other survey uh, methodologies which have been traditionally used. Uh, they are, these are very labor intensive. They are time consuming. The accuracy uh, can be high, can be low also, but you're only getting point information. You're not getting a full imagery of the uh, area. So that's where uh, we, we sit in that, you know, drones can come in and provide you very highly accurate, cost-effective uh, solution and also repeatable uh, data collection. At a you know at a very very discounted rate, so yeah I mean we do, do get very high resolution data. I'm talking about three to five centimeter of ground sampling distance uh, when we are doing drone surveys or aerial mapping uh, operations. Uh, the accuracy is also very high, depending on your uh, uh, your GCP placement or uh, depending on how you are maintaining your ground, ground sampling distance. You are able to maintain an accuracy of two to eight centimeters in horizontal. And this, I'm talking about the absolute accuracy. The relative accuracies are even higher. And uh, the update rate is also high since, you know, it's very easy for us to fly a drone in a particular location. I can, uh, you know, remap that area very, very regularly. Right, so uh, what else are we doing? So what we have realized is that just flying a drone is not solving the problem. Uh, uh, if, let's say, I sell a drone to an enterprise, they're not able to realize all the benefits of, uh, the data set, which is, you know, which can be uh, gathered from the drone itself. So what we are doing is that uh, we are uh, providing an end-to-end -end solution. That means that we are providing the pilot, we are providing the licenses, we are providing the infrastructure to process the data. We are also providing the analytics so that uh, the customer does not have to deal with all the intricacies of uh, uh, the, the how to process the data or how to handle the data, but they are only concerned with uh, you know, uh, the reports and final, final uh, data outputs. So what we are actually doing is we are reducing the time to value. So if you, let's say if someone works with AUS, they don't have a very, uh, you know, a steep learning curve in terms of uh, what actually has to do with drone. Uh, they only give us a contract and we take care of the rest of the things. So uh, since we are into data collection, we are into manufacturing dro of drones also, we know and have control of drones. Uh, then uh, we have a platform over which the data can be shared. And then we have a team of analytics, uh, uh, you know, engineers and GIS analysts who work on the data to provide more insights. Uh, just talking about a few tech components of, uh, you know, what AUS offers. We have a very effective uh, flight planning application called Skylink, which is able to handle, uh, you know, very difficult terrains also, very difficult kind of work environments also. If you have multiple small areas, uh, the pilot does not have to necessarily worry about uh, missing out any of those areas. The application does it on its own. If you're working on a corridor, you just have to give a center path and the uh, and the width of the corridor that is to be mapped. If you're working in a very large area, the drone is capable of you know um, flying on its own. It's fully autonomous. It knows when the battery is going down. It will come 
it will land you replace the battery it will continue with a slight overlap and uh, you know continue the mission so there is very low risk of data out in the field the, uh, then we uh, when we once we uh, you know plan and everything we have the capturing which is again done through our drones uh, so inside 2.0 is our latest uh, multi copter uh, we do have a hybrid also which is capable of five times of uh, the capability of this small multi copter drone it is lightweight and portable uh, this is the same drone being used uh, for uh, the somitva application in six states and uh, it gives us about 4 square kilometers or 4000 uh, sorry um, yeah about 4 square kilometers of uh, coverage per day uh, this particular drone and the hybrid gives us a average of about 5 15 square kilometers per day uh, the accuracies are also very high even without using this gcps you are getting accuracies within 10 cm and uh, the, it serves multiple applications this is the same drone which has been flying in many of the mines we have completed about 1500 flights from a single drone uh you know so this also talks about the reliability of the product uh when it comes to sharing of the data we have seen that uh, it is uh, the the kind of data set which is generated or the kind of data set which is normally available in the gis is very heavy in nature if you, i'm not talking about the vector data but the raster data so if you're talking about 2 uh, cm 3 cm resolution uh, tiff files these run into you know tens of gbs or even hundreds of gbs uh, the largest file that i have handled personally is about 600 gb uh, tiff so these files are huge but how do you make sure that the they are uh, you know uh, the the customer themselves are able to appreciate the benefit of all this data so what we have is a platform over which uh, multiple people can log in uh, they can have different access uh, permissions also so ceo ceo might have different dashboards and different access to someone let's say working on a site or an ops engineer who will have limited access to their data and no matter how big the tiff is no matter how big the data is they are able to easily visualize that on their mobile phone on, on their laptop on their you know even a, a small personal device so it becomes very easy to access all this data and you can integrate all the vector layers uh, charts plans maps whatever you want uh, on this data and since everything is available on the cloud you can very easily do change detection you can do swipe analysis you can see what my site was let's say 2 years back versus how it is right now so all these things are possible yeah so uh, again so uh, this is more talking about the mining experience there are various outputs which are available in the mine uh, when it comes to the mining applications which i have already mentioned earlier uh, this was one of the case studies that we have conducted uh, we did a assessment of total station versus drone versus the laser scanner uh, to estimate the volumetric uh, you know accuracy of uh, our assessment so uh, over the course of uh, you know uh, multiple days we did multiple assessments we did uh, you know uh, we flew the drone we had conducted uh, ts operations so we were able to find out that uh, the drones are 99% as accurate as the laser uh, scanner uh, which is a far more expensive technology and not as uh, flexible right uh, when it comes to uh, capturing of data i think 300 times more data was captured as compared to the total station which is again one of the technologies which is being used in the sites uh, these days Uh, the data collection aspect was also faster what we could achieve in let's say 1 hour uh, was something that required about uh, you know about a week's worth of manual efforts and uh, there were overall there were you know huge improve, improvements in the in their process and they were able to bring down their uh, survey mapping requirements from quarterly to now weekly so what they were doing four times a year now they are doing 52 times a year so this is uh, i mean this is the benefit realization Uh, when it comes to the mining industry again uh, we did similar exercises in cmpdi and coal india uh, different mines and we were able to uh, you know demonstrate the solution we were able to uh, bring the accuracy estimates to about 99% and uh, and uh, you know replace all their traditional uh, modes and methods of surveying so i mean i just like to show you some data before i finish So yeah, this is like one of the mines for uh, Odisha Mining Company that we had uh, mapped. So I hope you can see my screen. That uh, you know, if let's say I am a corporate, uh, I'm at the corporate office and I still like to visit the mine. I can do that in 3D and very easily. I have all the uh, you know uh, information in front of me and I can understand. Okay, this is a 
uh, there's a bench failure and the water is flowing down here, which is unsafe for people working down in the mine. Uh, this is my face where the material is being extracted. These are my hall roads. And definitely I can have my 3D layers, which are loaded on top of this. I can do my assessment of how steep my roads are, how, how wide my roads are. Are they maintaining the plans which I have prepared earlier? Uh, and, you know, a variety of other applications. Similarly, uh, let's say uh, this is a small uh, plant which is uh, next to a stockyard uh, for a raw material processing unit. So they want to build a brownfield project somewhere here and they still want to uh, store the material here. They have their conveyors running from one portion of the land to uh, the green portion which is going to be developed. So all this, uh, you know, scan to BIM, which was also discussed in the earlier presentations is happening on this data. From This is the raw, you can say a raw mesh from which... Uh, uh, which is used for uh, BIM modeling, uh, which is again used to make sure that there is no obstruction between a conveyor which is going from here to this location. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the objects which are already on the ground are intact. They are not damaged during construction or you know, uh, the construction and design activities happen once. So, uh, the, I mean, it is a saying in the industry that you measure twice but cut once. Uh, you know, it's a very low level, uh, you can say, analogy, but yeah, it, uh, it affects uh, this whole uh, larger projects also. Similarly, we are doing uh, the site analysis and, you know, stockyard measurement for other sites also. And we have a host of other data sets which are available. Uh, we are doing mapping for, you know, uh, normally when it comes to village mapping, we only have these kind of uh, village maps which are available. The Abadi area is shown uh, at a very small scale, nothing much is available. You only have boundaries which do not even align when it comes to, you know, putting it on a satellite map or a drone map. So what we're doing is we're redigitizing all of these things. And uh, now we have all the layers which are available, all the areas which can be computed. Uh, my screen is just loading. Yeah. And uh, then we have digitized each and every field boundary and then associated uh, the Khasra numbers and everything uh, with these polygons. Now this can be used by the revenue department to further uh, improve on this map and you know uh, to make sure that all the layers and details are available. And uh, if you compare it with uh, the satellite map, not much information is available. And uh, even the Abadi area is like uh, completely missed out in uh, very you know, low resolution uh, satellite maps. So this is again one of the concepts uh, through which uh, Somitva scheme is uh, working where they want to map the Abadi areas and have individual land parcels associated with the uh, you know landowners so that they can give them property cards which can give them benefits to uh, credits and you know schemes of the government and all these other things. So with this, I uh, come to an end to my presentation. Uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Abhudar Saxena for a presentation about drone technology and application of drones in the field of mining, urban and rural planning and precision farming, and also demonstration on 3D modeling. Uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Abhudar Saxena, on behalf of KAPST. Thank you, sir. Most welcome, yeah. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Raju MS, Managing Director of Thematics Infotech Private Limited, Bangalore. He completed his master's in geology from Bangalore University. Uh, his areas of expertise are geospatial technology, PGPS, LIDAR, 3D laser scanner, total station, subsurface mapping using GPR systems, UAV, remote sensing, digital image processing, and GIS. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, uh, it was a short notice, but uh, I haven't prepared any presentation as such, so request uh, Ramya to share whatever uh, uh, small PDF of our company is there. Yeah, thanks, Ramya. Thematics Infotech is a, a company which was established in about 2005. And uh, uh, since then, uh, we have been uh, specializing more on uh, primary data acquisition. 
uh, it's uh, basically a lot of uh, field work for data collection using the latest in uh, uh, surveying technologies, starting from uh, DGPS, total stations, and uh, LIDAR scanners, as well as uh, GPR for uh, underground uh, detection. Uh, we've also been using drones nowadays uh, for uh, uh, mapping. But uh, still the priority uh, for us uh, uh, is on mapping for infrastructure projects, uh, mainly for uh, the metros, the railways, roads, and uh, even for uh, corridor mapping where land acquisition is, uh, is slightly a, a big issue when it comes to uh, you know, land compensation distribution or uh, uh, even certification of uh, records for the sake of uh, distribution of the uh, compensations. Now, uh, here I'd like to uh, emphasize a little bit about uh, uh, the government norms that come in while uh, you have created data and uh, while you're submitting them. Uh, it's got to be uh, certified by the local authorities, especially the revenue department people. Uh, they come for the field visit, even though you have used the latest technologies and all those things, you still need to uh, abide by their uh, books. And then, uh, you know, uh, a final statement is given. Uh, some of the challenges I would say, uh, while using the geospatial technologies on the site, especially within the uh, urban areas, uh, is about the accuracy of the data that what, what you are going to present to the uh, client, which is basically a, the government authority. Uh, they will expect you all the time to be as reliable as possible so that uh, when it is presented in the court of law, if somebody contests your data, you got to be ready to defend uh, whatever uh, data you have surveyed and you have submitted. So, uh, well, that's, that's one of the big challenges and uh, uh, sometimes what we feel is going to get done within uh, six months, uh, sometimes takes about one and a half years to uh, finish a project. It's mainly because of uh, uh, these certification issues. And uh, uh, moving uh, uh, forward, uh, of course, uh, since we've been doing more for the government, uh, we have uh, learned the, uh, uh, you could say, art or the science of uh, uh, trying to give the data as reliably as possible uh, to the government agencies. And uh, uh, we've also been specializing a lot on uh, underground utilities uh, survey, uh, basically for power lines, water, gas, as well as for the telecom utilities. Uh, we have been uh, using the GPR quite extensively. And nowadays, we have also been using GPR for detection of underground utilities, even before uh, uh, digging up for uh, laying pile foundations for the metros. So some of the uh, large contractors who are handling the metro works are taking our services for uh, doing the underground uh, detection. It's basically done using uh, GPR systems. We've got multiple uh, frequency GPR systems coupled with uh, high accuracy DGPS antennas. Uh, which give a uh, very good accuracy about uh, the kind of uh, uh, obstructions or the utilities that might be uh, buried underneath. So this uh, coupled with uh, surface mapping uh, done using uh, LIDAR technology is being used to prepare uh, very accurate maps. Uh, <clears throat> well, not, not everything is going on to a GIS domain because uh, most of the utility maps, while they're being used on the site, uh, is being used by people who do not have any knowledge about uh, GIS or they do not have a software or they haven't used uh, uh, any uh, GIS utilities uh, earlier. So it will basically be the linemen or basically be the contractors uh, who will be making use, making use of uh, these maps. Hence, uh, presenting the map on a large sheet of paper or in the form of an atlas with very accurate scale is quite a challenge. So when it comes to the site and when you have given your maps, so it's it's a test for you that uh, they will just go through the entire corridor and see whether all the utilities or all the physical features that has been presented in the map is actually available uh, on the ground or not. Um, 
uh, you've got a lot of uh, tree canopy within the city. So not every part of the city uh, can be actually mapped using uh, drones, uh, though we use drones uh, in some open areas. But when it comes to uh, corridors which are quite narrow and which are uh, having trees, uh, there's no other go, but we have to come down to the ground and then uh, do an on-foot survey using uh, uh, LiDAR scanners or uh, uh, using uh, total stations. Even sometimes the DGPS, because of the multipath problem, it gives you a lot of errors and uh, you tend to spend more time in data acquisition within the city lanes. So, uh, but well, uh, things have been, uh, you know, ironed out to a, a large extent where we use the combination of uh, all these technologies for trying to get uh, accurate maps. Uh, well, other projects, uh, what uh, thematics has been uh, handling is related to serving of uh, mines and quarries where uh, they want to estimate uh, how much of material has been taken out. And uh, they also want to make out if there is been in this, uh, there's been any encroachment uh, uh, closer to the lease areas. And also preparation of this baseline survey reports wherever there is no data at all for the quarries. So this is where uh, we have been using geospatial technologies and uh, uh, handling a lot of work for uh, mines and drainage department as well as for uh, private quarry owners. And year on year we have been uh, visiting those quarries for uh, making a, a audit of the quantities that have been removed. Uh, similarly, uh, land audit also is being carried out for uh, some of the departments where they want to compare how much of land has actually been given out for the entrepreneurs or for the industries uh, compared to how much of uh, land that was uh, that's actually been occupied by them uh, on the ground. And sometimes it so happens that uh, the uh, layout should have been formed, but not all the land would have been, uh, you know, uh, audited for in terms of the geographical area, there might be some discrepancies. So using these geospatial technologies, uh, we have been identifying uh, places which have already been allocated, but at the same time not accounted for also. And the ones we have been pointed out, then the government takes a decision of, uh, well, what has to be done with the balanced land or uh, in case there has been more land than that has been uh, acquired. Uh, some decisions they take uh, within, but at least the data is available for them to take a decision. And uh, another strong sector is the power sector where uh, the electric lines, uh, the overhead lines, that is the extra high voltage lines, corridors are mapped so that uh, uh, we know the best route through which the corridor can be uh, routed so that from one uh, substation to the other substation, which is the best route to be taken. Uh, earlier, they used to use uh, satellite images, uh, but now since uh, drones are giving a much uh, higher resolution, uh, they're using that as well. But once it comes to the construction stage, uh, we have to make use of uh, laser-based instruments. There can be either LiDAR or it can also be uh, total stations. Well, uh, this is in short about uh, thematics infotech. Uh, Ramya, I had shared another PDF which just lists out the major projects that has been carried out. Uh, is it possible to just share it on the screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay, so just a minute.
Ah, uh, no, sir. You shared the same pe same PDF only, sir. Just send one more. Okay. Yeah, I'll just. Yeah, I've just sent it. Okay, sir, I will check. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, another uh, uh, interesting application of the geospatial technologies is uh, of uh, uh, assessment of uh, property tax for very large uh, buildings. Like sometimes you have got uh, buildings which are about. a couple of lakhs of square feet like uh, 10 lakh square feet 20 lakh square feet these kind of things which is uh, shared by uh, several owners since the tax is being assessed based upon uh, you know tied up to uh, a person by person uh, you need to actually uh, make statements uh, katha wise and then you know uh, give very detailed measurements and then uh, assess it uh, in comparison with the self assessment that has been already filed by the owners so uh, here too we have been uh, assisting the bbmp for doing this work and uh, uh, it's been quite uh, interesting that a lot of uh, extra revenue is being uh, uh, seen in this particular uh, discipline of work and uh, Uh, since uh, these are all very high profile buildings and uh, the owners also are very influ influential people uh, there is a tendency of uh, people challenging the reports in the court uh, so because uh, there is extra revenue that needs to be uh, collected from those sites so here also we need to be quite careful about uh, uh, what kind of reports have actually been submitted and what is the veracity of it and what is the accuracy of uh those statistics that we have been providing to the bbmp so uh, we have completely been using uh, uh, laser technology that is uh, lidar technology for this because we also need to map the internals of the buildings so uh, here's a uh, a small note about uh, the kind of works that we have been carrying out and uh, to give a small example uh we mapped the entire itpl building which is nearly a crore square feet with a, a matter of about 30 days we worked in and day out that's 24 hours uh, mapping permission was given and we we completed the buildings and we have uh, mapped the buildings and we have given the reports now it is left to the uh, authorities to actually go ahead and uh, you know uh, demand the extra tax or uh, take up uh, next level of action and uh, similarly one for uh, the mining also uh, and uh, a lot of underground utilities uh, uh, detection where uh, these maps are being uploaded into the portals of the uh, bbmp so that whenever somebody wants to come and do a road cutting uh, in case we have mapped those areas then that data will be available for them to be careful before uh, actually digging up the road so that at least in case some power lines are there they can if the data if we have mapped that data over there uh, they can readily look into it and say they can be careful about not digging in those places uh well i think uh, that's it for, from my uh, from my side thank you very much uh, to kcsd for providing this opportunity thank you Uh, thank you very much mr raju ms for your presentation about mapping of underground utilities using gpr techniques and other techniques like lidar laser scanning total station and dgps etc uh, once again thank you sir on behalf of kcsc welcome now we will move on to next segment civil society i would like to introduce our speaker dr lingraju y hydrogeologist 
former director of Karnataka State Remote Sensing Application Center and director of Geomatic Center, Water Resource Management Organization, Government of Karnataka, professor and research with Global Academy of Technology. He has experience of five decades and he has fellow membership in GSI, Indian Society of Remote Sensing, National Institute of Hydrology. He has served as an expert member of initiatives in groundwater resource, drinking water management, flood mitigation methodologies, artificial intelligence, dam safety, impact and tunneling, irrigation and application of geomatics techniques for water resource planning and investigation. And he appreciated and acknowledged, acknowledged by the Limca Book of Records, Geospatial Excellence Award, Rashtriya Jala Puraskar, Rotary Karnataka, and he is recognized by Honorable Prime Minister of Karnataka in Man Ki Baat pro program. He is currently heading a dynamic team of dedicated volunteers engaged in more than 47 projects on river rejuvenation by Art of Living. His vision is to solve the freshwater crisis of this world. Sir, now over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, Ramya, I have sent the PPT. Can you can you share it? Oh, uh, my presentation is on the project which we have been doing since ten years, uh, uh, rejuvenating the riverine ecosystem. That is the topic, and. Um, the geospatial technology has been uh, very helpful. Let me change this slide. Yeah, uh, you have to change the slide. Hello. Uh, see, the uh, problems are many, you know, see, uh, the, with respect to the water and uh, all the natural resources. Uh, there has been a degradation and uh, the whole ecosystem is getting uh, degraded and a uh, lot of scarcity, disasters, unhealthy environment, and peace is getting into pieces. That is the problem. Solution exists in nature. Harmonious and balanced management of natural resources exist, which has been cyclic to keep the environment hale and healthy. About 50 years back, this kind of problems were not there. Uh, of course, uh, very rarely there used to be a drought or a flood. But now, nowadays, every year, we, we are seeing the drought and uh, floods to occur. How to solve these problems? That is the, the, the to analyze the factors of geospatial technology. By geospatial technology is uh, uh, very helpful to us because we are into, next slide please. See, uh, drastic land use change. We, we have been seeing the changes so much uh, and these changes, the land use changes are imbalancing the hydrological cycle. Because once the forest is removed and the soil erosion takes place, that natural process of uh, recharging and renewability of the fresh water is getting get stunted. And we are, uh, even the soils are not retaining the uh, moisture uh, because they are more exposed to the sun and uh, more, more erosion is also happening. So decreasing this natural vegetation uh, is the main cause of the, um, uh, the uh, natural hydrological cycle uh, is getting stunted. And uh, additionally, we are exploiting. One side, we are not allowing the natural process of recharging. The other side, we are exploiting it, over exploiting in creating the balance that exists. And additionally, we are polluting all the sources also. Next. Next, please. So the, there are many, uh, uh, many aspects of natural resource management. For that, we have to create an action plan. First, we have to copy how the hydrological cycle was operating and the nature has its own 
management uh, system, uh, everything was getting renewed and uh, uh, it was hell and healthy. When once this uh, disturbance is happening, you have to prevent the plan of action, how to revive it. For that, we need to understand the, what was the natural processes and natural arrangement that existed. For example, the drainage network itself. This drainage network has come to existence since the earth came into existence. And it also depends on the um, geomorphology and mythology of the area. And they have the hydrological boundaries also. So the land use, I mean, came in later, but there was a good land cover, which was convenient for the um, uh, hydrological uh, cycle. So now we, it is easy for us to, by using the geospatial technology, we have been able to map each and everything with the location specific and also create the 3D models also and the control maps and, and also we can overlay the administrative boundaries because we have to address village wise now. The gram panchayats are empowered to manage the resources. So if we can prepare the action plan and give it to the uh, gram panchayats, they will be able to uh, address the issues uh, the, the way which we give the action plan. Next. So the, uh, just for example, we have rejuvenated one uh, river, the Kumutwati, which was supplying drinking water to Bangalore, which got, ready, uh, which got dried up. And in the upstream of this uh, reservoir, which was supplying drinking water to Bangalore, there are 278 villages. They also were starving for water and they used to buy water. Um, so when we started this, uh, preparing the action plan, uh, we could trace the uh, path of the water and convert the rainwater into groundwater along the natural streams itself because natural streams are the geomorphic uh, units where there, there is, they, are, they are created by the subsurface fractures and also the weathered zones. So we, it was the easy way for us to uh, convert the rainwater in, into groundwater by going for uh, rainwater harvesting structures and recharge structures. We, we created some 30,000 structures all along the, all the, along the uh, natural streams starting from first order to the uh, fifth order. And uh, we could see a lot of uh, changes in the water levels, uh, they, uh, we, which were very shallow, very, very deep, have come to the shallow level, and streams start flowing. The upstream area recharge uh, could create the long uh, runoff, uh, even during the normal season. Next, please. So they, we divided the whole basin into different uh, uh, mini watersheds, and the action plans were prepared. And it was reported to the Gram Panchayats and also the CSR uh, supporters could uh, know how the uh, technicality be behind the project and also the results uh, which, we, which we could also use the geospatial technology to um, find out the changes that being occurred uh, in the next slides. So the, basically the geology is uh, very important where uh, two types of rocks are there and their uh, hydrological character was under, understood and the whole thing was divided into uh, 18 uh, mini watersheds and each mini watershed uh, the, uh, around the average of 25 square kilometer, we calculated the rainfall, uh, average rainfall and what budget it is and after knowing the water availability, the action plan was prepared by locating it with the GPS and the, the volunteers moved to the sites, educated the farmers and the action plan, the action was implemented. So these are the type of thematic maps that we used Next, please. I'll not go in detail. So, use of geospatial technology was very helpful for us because uh, each and every stream was mapped and uh, the uh, site was examined and 
civil designs were made to um, uh, create the proper design to easily convert the surface water into groundwater. And we use the Google Maps for the volunteers to take it to the go to the site and locate it also. And these maps were given on the mobile app, app applications. And it was easy for them to collect the data also, whether it is well inventory or the uh, structures that we made to report it back uh, like that. Next, please. So the Google My Maps were used. Uh, it was uh, very easy for the even the uh, uh, matriculates also could uh, take uh, take these maps uh, with their mobiles and uh, started working with this. Next, please. So this way, we, we, we have been able to uh, create the action plan and educate the farmers and also the uh, funding agencies, whether it is government or the CSR agents, so, th so that they will be very confident of this kind of projects and there was very good encouragement and the scientific uh, way of doing this has given very good results also. Next, please. Well, the, 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 um, there are very good features to collect the data, monitoring it, and uh, also uh, even the multilingual forms were given to the farmers to um, uh, collect the data. And the data is even being now collected. It is not only the groundwater, even now we are working on the surface water body re revival. And the Gram Panchayas will be educated and the uh, people there, the local people, uh, are able to collect the data and make it transparent how the silt is being removed and how it is taken to the farmer's land. Next. Next slide, please. So use of this uh, data collected by the apps uh, were for locating the recharge structures and also the tree planting uh, in the area, uh, the common properties uh, and different phases were seen. Primarily, first we uh, surveyed and then prepared the action plan and implemented. And it is also monitored. And we could see the change. Next, please. So these are the structures. We could uh, even see how uh, during the rainy season, the this could help. Uh, for example, this is a water pool which was created near a water body where the water gets collected and make it available even during summer. The cattle could drink the water and around these structures, trees were planted to create what is called as eco-restoration cells. And these are very transparent because the uh, cameras used also carry the uh, GPS uh, locations. And uh, this is being done, we started in Kumudvati and now we are into different uh, 13 uh, districts of Karnataka where Narega is uh, being employed. In the Narega scheme, the uh, job card holders will work it and also it reports uh, report to the rural development department at the different uh, levels where it can be monitored and their uh, salaries will be distributed to their banks. So these are the advantages of these technologies and uh, we have been successfully using almost uh, since 10 years and now we want to adopt it for the further research also, this action research. Next, please. So our method uh, is very systematic, uh, starting from the data collection, analysis, and all the thematic maps to be studied, and uh, the appropriate uh, civil designs are to be are, are evolved, and then they will take it to the field and uh, do it and even monitor it. These are the uh, sort of flow chart that we adopted and uh, carried out the projects in uh, different states also. Next, please. So this is a simple thing uh, which we could uh, demonstrate to even to the farmers, how the water moves along the natural streams and 
how it percolates to the weathered rock and even the fractured rock by uh, recharge structures. And the water that recharges in the upstream area um, uh, will be converted into groundwater. And uh, this groundwater upwells in the lower altitude uh, as an environmental flow and fills the water pools that we have collected. And also the natural vegetation uh, is being uh, made. And these are the simple three, four type of uh, structures we evolved and it has been very successful. And um, uh, visibly the changes are being monitored also. Next please. The, the, uh, the, uh, in detail, for example, the, uh, I told in the beginning that drastic land use change has been responsible for the um, uh, uh, soil erosion and uh, runoff without even percolating into the soils and the soil uh, moisture retention is uh, spoiled. And for that, what we have uh, devised is uh, along the uh, streams, the running water has to be made slow for that. We have constructed what are called as boulder checks. These are very simple solutions, locally available material is used. And the water checks its speed because every frequency of about 250 to 300 meters, the water flows slow and supports the soil moisture, number one. Number two, next to these boulder checks, we have what are called as recharge wells. See, the wells were dug for drawing water, but here to put the water back, we have constructed what are called as recharge wells, dig uh, about 20 feet uh, from the bottom of the stream and uh, uh, allow the water to percolate into the weathered zone, which will, uh, which will uh, prevent the runoff and uh, recharges the groundwater. And in places, wherever the gediment intersections are there, where the fractures are more and uh, the uh, intense uh, drilling has happened. So in such, uh, we have adopted such criteria to go for what are called as recharge borewells. From the bottom of these recharge wells, we drill a bore and, uh, in, and uh, make it, a, put a filter over it, where the water goes deep to the 250 to 300 feet and spread in the uh, fractured zones. So these such things can create springs in the downstream area. And the water pools, wherever the water bodies are there, because the water bodies are silted up and more evaporation is taking place, they are creating water, uh, water pools where the uh, rate of evaporation is less and it creates a column of water instead of sheet of water and it reduces the evapotranspiration and it is sustainability water will be available uh, through the year even in spite of uh, failure of rains also water used to be there and uh, cattle will depend on that water and around that, we go for tree plantation. And these tree plants we planted about uh, eight, nine years back. Now it, is, uh, it has created a sort of mini forest where the eco restoration at a micro level happened. Bees and birds are attracted. And these models, each and every village, it is, there is scope. And our uh, mapping with a geospatial technology will help us to create such structures, estimate what would be the cost, attract the government uh, schemes, whatever is there to implement. And we are also into monitoring it, taking the water levels and also um, going for uh, remote sensing methods to measure the greenness index. Uh, and we have prepared the, uh, even the impact assessment reports time to time involving the third party side. So this is the, uh, uh, that um, greenness index where it is increased before and after. Uh, and um, this take, of course, this takes a long time and also it needs uh, very intense work and a, a, a macro level work also. We have to address each and every village and all the villages lying in a hydrological boundary will give the good results. Next. So this impact assessment I told you is uh, how it was and how it is now. 
and in the same season also the kind of you know, assessment could be made uh, using the geospatial technology next please so uh, so far we have been able to uh, revive the parts of front 49 is uh, rivers and uh, uh, rivulets and uh, about uh, the these are the figures uh, of, of progress whatever we have been made and this is the, taking us a long way is now it has become our national project and uh, we are into different states like uh, uh, we started from karnataka uh, continued in tamil nadu and maharashtra now that andhra and U up also we have been able to work the success whatever we have made is attracting and we are getting the invite, invites from the government as well as the csr funding agencies to take this forward uh, so next is our um, we have to give it research touch for this hence we are planning what is called as action research any more slide um ah oh, this is the way forward yeah take okay. way forward uh this planning implementation uh, awareness bringing uh, is a, now that um, <coughs> jaljeevan mission has been asking us to create awareness and uh, also uh, assess the impacts at uh, the micro and macro level and uh, adopt these measurements and contribute the policy making this and once we do this um, now we are planning to go for a sort of what is called as Uh, action research involving the different departments implementation departments to um, follow our action plan and also um, invest their um, uh, funds available uh, on the same area uh, covering whether it is um, groundwater recharge uh, uh, tank rejuvenation uh, tree for i mean forestation agroforestry agro horticulture etc this kind of convergence is possible because the uh, panchayat system has that kind of convergence programs we are talking to them and finally we have to uh, measure and metric the uh, results and come out with a uh, research oriented uh, policy making so these are the, these are the things which uh, uh, we have been able to do this i think uh, i'm Running out of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, these these are the areas which we have selected now. I invite anybody to join us. Uh, yeah, whether it is the application of the technology or uh, the um, domain uh, knowledge or even funding agencies and the government departments to associate with us to pre, uh, take up this action research. Now we are proposing action research. in two watersheds one upstream of the uh, one vilas reservoir gauri halla and another downstream uh, garani halla so these uh, in this uh, areas which we have looked and identified for research action research we want all the departments and funds available for that to um, implement and also side by side conduct research to establish the methodologies that we have adopted which are not much of uh, engineering solutions but natural solutions and at the micro level maybe with the gram panchayat as a implementing agency uh, so that people will be more aware of their own problems and uh, uh, their own solutions uh, involving the um, community mobilization it be or the awareness and also their own way of what we had earlier the panchayat system that uh, need and dish system like that to water balance has to be understood and also they have to prepare their own uh, water security plans and all other socio economic things has to happen so this kind of research will definitely uh, help the policy makers to Uh, adopt such methods and also a policy to uh, converge and work on the natural system to revive the natural system back uh, how it was and that's why we call it as resilient river and ecosystem 
it is not only agro agriculture or horticulture but also the entire ecosystem uh, to make the uh, river uh, resilient that is our aim in the representative watersheds like that whatever we do should help us to make it the river basin nice um, keeping apart the administrative boundaries the entire uh, river basins are to be addressed maybe with the uh, fermentation combination of agro climatic zones and uh, geological zones we can create such modules and spread the entire country to make all our rivers um, revived and the whole climate uh, is addressed thank you for this and uh, thanks to the organizers yeah some more slides are there yeah. there the video oh. okay uh, these are the slides which uh, you can see in our website also and uh, uh, i invite uh, each and everybody who whoms who is interested because our season um, non government organizations and we don't have that kind of uh, Uh, rest, uh, restrictions or uh, constraints. Uh, we can think beyond uh, any uh, government system and uh, make it possible scientifically and uh, honor the nature. Thank you very much. Any questions are there? You can answer. Uh, hi, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lingra Jowai. Uh, for a presentation about uses of geospatial technology in water resources and action plan for reclamation of water logged area in a kumbhadwati watershed uh, thank you sir once again thank you lingraju sir on behalf of kacst uh, if you have any questions kindly post it on chat box <laughs> I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. H. S. Sudhira. He completed PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. His research interest centers on how town towns and cities evolve. He has been publishing scientific research articles for a while now. He research has a uh, has been primarily on land use and land cover change studies, exploring their consequence on in environmental sustainability and understanding their. interrelationship with resource and transportation his broader research addresses the evolution and growth of towns and cities invoking complexity science understanding planning practice and studying the effect of governance he was a faculty member at the indian institute of human settlements earlier he had a stint with the directorate of urban land transport government of karnataka as land use and transportation specialist He is a board watcher and volunteer for Indian Literate, Literacy Project. Currently, he is the director of Gubbi Labs. Now, over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I thank the KCSC for inviting me and uh, uh, sharing, uh, giving this presentation session today. Let me share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. So, uh, what I will be talking about is uh, on some of the challenges with uh, going about our observation for you know here in the global village as the theme is. Uh, for almost about two decades, uh, I've been working on uh, satellite remote sensing and earth observation. So, I'll uh, keep this uh, simple and uh, possibly. Quicker as well. Uh, so, if you see, look at the landscape of you know Earth observation, uh, as in what we also know, also call as remote sensing. Uh, there have been it's a, like it's been in in place for almost uh, four decades, and largely thanks to the Indian Space Research Pro Organization and the Space Program. And almost uh, now, uh, all state governments also has a geo portal. And a host of geo-related services are also being offered by the respective state government agencies. Uh, we will also see a mind map, which also tries to capture some of them. 
and largely i think uh, until recently we have uh, a lot of such studies have also been taken up by the academia and is in largely universities uh, be it iic or iits and so on of course we also have in the indian sub remote sensing national remote sensing uh, center at hyderabad uh, some of them and prl of space application center in ahmedabad some of them who have been largely taking up uh, larger earth observation studies but i think something that has emerged now over the last uh, at least in the two decades itself is despite satellite remote sensing data or other observation data being available for now almost four years the last couple of years has been more exciting uh, for multiple reasons one uh, i think as many of you have already uh, are aware or uh, have experienced uh no longer we are now re- depending on our respective systems like my laptop or or previously a workstation or a desktop to run such uh, or analysis on in, of you know satellite remote sensing data or earth observation data today a lot of such data analysis can happen through cloud based uh, platforms i'm sure somebody would have at least touched uh, using google earth engine or so in in our the previous talks So I'm not getting into that at the moment, but things like Google Earth Engine uh, have, and, and a couple more I'll share in a bit, have really transformed the way that we are now looking at uh, our observation data analysis on the cloud. So no longer uh, I'm limited by my what what is my RAM, uh, what is happening to my, you know, uh, hard disk. Do I have the space? I can remember like uh, early in my early days when we were there. You know, Uh, even using IRS data, landsat data, the zip file itself would be like 300, 400 MB, and once you unzip and then you're in, in no time, you're already eating up over one GB of uh, data space, and uh, your system RAM was an issue and all of that. So now, no longer we are all uh, facing such issues. But something else that has become a, a, a real uh, challenge while using uh, cloud based eo data analysis platforms is the availability of training data on the other hand also while you have this cloud based uh, uh, you know eo data analysis platforms uh, something that has also more become more popular are the artificial intelligence or machine learning based methods for uh, data analysis uh, so while we have that one of the prereq for all of them is availability of good training data now unfortunately in india i think uh, or uh, for a, co- a lot of things out here we are sort of uh, seriously limited by access to uh, training data now if you look at the landscape of uh, indian geospatial data here uh, this is sort of if you look at who who is in charge at like at least from the organization sense the department of science and technology government of india is is a key uh, uh plays a pivotal role there and as many of you must have been aware uh we have one of the oldest scientific organizations in the country which is the survey of india which has played a pivotal role there as well and then we also have the uh, national atlas of climatic mapping organization under the dsp and as the department of space we have a national remote sensing center space application center in rrsc we also have iisc which is see there uh, that is in, in all science of training and in terms of remote sensing as well but apart from that we have a host of other government of india uh, organizations from uh, forest survey of india geological survey of india water commission ground water board and a host of uh, state gis and remote sensing application centers uh that are all uh, playing some uh, key role in responding to demands by the respective governments or their respective departments itself while they are there on the one hand on the other hand if you look at uh, the kind of existing policies until recently we were sort of really limited by uh, uh by the way the policies had shaped up a lot of things uh uh you know technically when we started working with maps uh, uh legally we were uh, not supposed to digitize a topo sheet and the topo sheet was the only way of you know having a more reliable data or uh, special geo special data but thankfully i think uh, uh, with survey of india opening up or having other access like open street map and whole bunch of other data sources being available today uh, we are no longer limited to kind of you know gone are the days that one should 
go about digitizing. And besides that, we also have more progressive geospatial uh, policies that have emerging. Now, one, you have the new geospatial policy uh, uh, that has been notified last year and the guidelines issued uh, in 2021. And prior to that, we also had the national data sharing and accessibility policy. Uh, earlier, uh, before the geospatial policy happened in 2021, there was a draft version. And similarly, for the remote sensing or earth observation data, we also have a draft space RS policy 2020. And uh, there are, there's an NGP 2020 draft also uh, there, uh, which is awaiting uh, the cabinet approval for formal notification as it stands today. Uh, some of the things that like particularly with uh, ISO and uh, uh, which is responsible for your data sharing and access, uh, some of the things seems to be really progressive and uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of opening up of uh, uh, data and access to them, perhaps through APIs and stuff like that. And whole, uh, one could really hope that a lot of things will change because of that. On the other hand, like you see, there are a bunch of these geoportals. Uh, primarily, we have Bhutan, Bhuvan, and then we have Vedas by the uh, Space Application Center at Ahmedabad or ENXA of the Survey of India and Bharat Maps. And the incidentally, we also have NSDI which uh, I strongly think needs uh, a revival or overhauling of how it is shaping up. Uh, and then uh, Bhumi at the national level by the NDSS LUT. And Krishi, Bhukosh, Injavare, Snapmo, IRS. Almost everybody, every other team, the national level organization uh, have uh, set up, come up with their own geo portals as well. And also among the like uh, civil society, we have Tamil, uh, we have the Indian Society of Remote Sensing. We have also other private sectors coming in, like CropIn, Genesis, and of course Google and Mapbox have been there. Here, MapMagia. This is not an exhaustive list, but give you, gives you a sense of some of the old players and new players as well. Like particularly, let's say, uh, if you look at SiteShot and CropIn, there have been now uh, the new startups. Uh, I guess also based in Bangalore, and uh, are somebody using. Uh, Earth observation data aggressively for forecasting crop uh, related aspects and also monitor monetizing on that. So this kind of gives you an overview of where it stands with respect to a lot of things, but uh, uh, largely I think uh, it, it kind of uh, depends on how the policies are shaping and why one should be uh, very really worried about some of these policies is uh, these, are, these policies are something that will enable one to use them effectively distribute them, publish them, and enable the use of such data. One of the limiting parameters in, in most of these such uh, things, uh, I'm not uh, you know, pointing out to any particular one here, but across all of the geo portals, there are issues of data quality attributes which are not spelled out. There are issues of data distribution policy that are not stated. And the critical thing is that there is no availability of training data uh, in the public domain. Now, uh, yeah, I, I did my, I did indicate, show you something called radiant earth in the previous slide, but I didn't talk about it. Uh, like open uh, street map, we have something called as radiant uh, ML hub. Uh, uh, for those who are interested, maybe you should take a look at radiant ML hub. Uh, basically what it is doing is it is, collating a host of train machine learning based or machine ready training data for processing, particularly for a host of crops in Africa and elsewhere. Unfortunately, we don't have similar things in India. So while we can claim we have been into remote sensing and earth observation studies for the last four decades and a host of such organizations being there, uh, we still don't have a single standard repository of standard, like saying this are the training data for these crop types. For instance, uh, we have two like two popular cropping seasons like Harif and Rabi or and so on, and then uh, we have a host of commercial crops. Like if you just take a uh, look at Karnataka itself, you have areca, coconut, uh, banana plantations, or sugarcane, paddy, and host of them are there. Even millets, for that matter. So, but uh, while 
from the government and the private sector, there are a bunch of things that has happened. Uh, we still clearly lack access to training data. So every time when we access new remote sensing data that are come that is coming in, uh, one needs to still go about collecting new training data for doing their analysis. Now, why is that so critical? Why is that? Why am I talking about it? Like I told you earlier, I think with, with whatever has changed in, in the last couple of years, our methods of analysis or the platforms for analysis have changed as in you're no longer doing it on your system and doing an analysis for a country scale can happen like in, in, in minutes, if not seconds, uh, if, I'm, if I'm using Google Earth Engine. But even for me to classify it accurately and make it good, one of the critical components, maybe I, I may have a good model already uh, developed or calibrated, but uh, if I don't use the right training data, then whatever model results that I'm going to get will be uh, going for a toss. So if, if I have to, if I were to one or to do any such large, large scale analysis of things, uh, looking at, let's say different cropping patterns or urban growth or change in water body and a whole bunch of things, right? Across the landscape, we have a lot of things that one could really look up. But for each of those uh, larger land cover classifications and different land uses, uh, there doesn't seem to exist a standard repository of training data. So what is happening is each of the organizations which are doing working on it are generating their own training data. Certainly they are machine ready, but unfortunately they are not put out. Uh, for a host of reasons, like uh, like last year we did a study on this and to understand what is happening. So the government has different uh, concerns and the private sector, since they have already invested on it, they don't want to share it for the right reasons that uh, how will they get uh, compensated if they, if, if they are putting it out as in, in, in free, for free, so on. So I think this is something that uh, will need a larger uh, contemplation as to what needs to happen and how to go about it. But the point is, I think uh, eventually at some point, it's critical, uh, if not later now, uh, sooner or later that we evolve something like that. And perhaps uh, Karnataka, since it has already been, always been a uh, leader in many of these aspects, if it's the right thing for, uh, Karnataka or perhaps the KACSP to take a first step in that regard and see how to go about setting up certain things for, you know, put opening up Earth observation training data. Just posting some of the screenshots of uh, other EO-based platforms that one could use. Uh, Google Earth Engine is not the only one. Uh, there are a host of things like we have Open Data Cube, we have Open EO, CFR. You also have Earth on AWS. I'm sure many of you would have come across uh, Amazon's uh, web services there, AWS services. So uh, there is also a repository of different uh, Earth observation data on AWS. And one can also use a host of their systems and you know, uh, processes to also train models, run them on the cloud. So you can create different instances and try to work on it. and sort of things like that. So there are, it's just really rapidly changing the way we were looking at our observation in the past. Uh, so unfortunately for one of the key limiting factors has been the availability of training data. So how do we go about it? So there are a couple of things. I think one is really nearly uh, look up uh, on that is uh, we need more training capacity. Uh, particularly uh, all the geospatial professionals need to be aware of, of the typical etiquette on data sharing. So there are a host of things. Uh, uh, if, if one needs to really look at what is happening with respect to data sharing, creating the right metadata for it, talking about the data quality of it, what is the accuracy of the data, what are the kind of attributes that are there, when was it collected, what does the at, you know, data contain and things like that. Uh, I guess uh, when, when when we train uh, uh, people or you know, professionals towards creating such data, it is imperative that uh, we also you know educate uh, them on some of these aspects. 
and so that when in the long run when when that is taken up in the long run uh, we really end up creating a very good repository of such training data two i think there can be some sort of a mechanism for you know incentivizing data share uh, that's something the state and the governments should think of so also can be a bunch of citizen science activities to enable wider you know uh, collection of training data for instance uh, you know ksac or c is also rightly positioned to go about you know initiating some of the citizen science programs uh, uh, through their schools for instance we can have a nice uh, uh, outdoor activity for high school students to go across and look at what crops are there they can use an app and then through the app they can record uh, certain polygons of whether what crops were grown whether there are millets different type of millets paddy or are they into in some plantations and maybe if you want add additional attributes like whether it was irrigated well or non irrigated or things like that and host of activities students can also start appreciating what crops are grown in their backyard for uh, for us Uh, there will be a mechanism where uh, they gather data and input them, and the respective high school teacher or the science teacher in charge can curate them and make sure that there are no errors there and send it across here. So without actually going into the field, somebody in KCSC can really get hold of things like that, and that can be really scaled. And annually, KCSC can also then publish so sort of such of uh, you know set of such. training data on host of things that can be done so there are uh, many such creative ways one could really think through and see uh, all of them and uh, so on the one hand if you may see that it is just gathering training data but on the other hand if you look at it it is also some sort of a real outdoor education on geography on local landscapes what is happening with respect to different set of things and other set of aspects right so i think that that way i think set of like there are multiple goals that can be achieved through that and the other thing one could also look at it is uh, there is uh, we have this national data sharing and accessibility policy uh, through which and uh, uh, under the dsp and there is also an ai mission under the prime minister's science technology innovation and advisory council through which some of this can also be integrated the other key aspect i think uh, largely for a larger policy level is that uh, in the current space rs policy drafts that we have uh there is still not a mention on of uh, what will happen to the your training data and also kind of uh, ring fencing aspects on data quality i think that is very key another key thing is uh, i think whoever is hosting any geospatial data as through geo portals should be mandated to state what licenses they are putting in and what is the like license for data and what is the policy on data distribution and under what license they are putting it out the government of india has already like kind of come out with what is called as open government data license and unfortunately i'm not sure if all government departments have made aware of it but it is the standard uh, license that the government of india is promoting and uh, if you may be aware there is already something called as data.gov.in and most of the data on data.gov.in is released under ogdf so one uh, different states may not reinvent what license should we worry about government of india has already has this and it's it's kind of open and uh, fair fairly uh, something that is usable something like what you already have as creative commons and so on so uh, it may be imperative that even uh, uh, whatever geo portals that respective agencies are putting out uh, it will be really nice and useful for the end user and others to also know of under what license and data distribution policy that they are uh, put out unfortunately many most of the uh, geo portals don't state it as in it sort of somebody has to go through find a fine print there somewhere and and it's kind of pretty vague and it is not uh, accurate as well and uh like i said i said earlier i would like to reiterate that i think it's also imperative that they mention on data policy which is also not mentioned in, in any of these geo portals so i think uh, i leave it at this and i'll be open for a little discussion i know i know it is kind of a quick uh, short presentation if there are any questions i'll be happy to take them up okay uh, 
thank you very much dr sudhira hs for the presentation about earth observation geospatial data geo portal open source and policy policy issues uh, once again i thank uh, sudhir sir on behalf of kcst uh, if you have any questions uh, send me ask and or else post it in chat box hi sudhir hi i am uh, dr nandish you know i attended uh, tvr program uh, along with you when you are mm -hmm. doing a research in iasc right. i i a very good uh, informative uh, talk you have given a recent uh, information and i need uh, one information yeah. from your side nowadays yeah. we are using for a study of a crop maybe yeah. yield or a status whatever may be we are using more about uh, machine learning and deep learning about yeah. uh, uh, rs data can yeah. you give any brief inputs about using these two what yeah. actually will get more from this thank you yeah sure so uh, what is happening in what is happening is uh, like in the in some of the countries like africa uh, african countries uh, people have managed to get a host of good training data on different growth stages of the crop and in different conditions now all of these are curated very well and trained uh, using a host of different machine learning models like uh, some some sort of reinforcement based learning as well so uh, basically there is like uh, one popularly either some based uh, some of the neural network based uh, uh, models are used or a host of there are uh, different uh, uh, classification methods that are available uh, some decision tree to uh, random thing and all of that so uh, what's happening is uh, one we could also test different models when we have good training data and look at uh, what is uh, uh, what is the different growth stage and quality of the crop types so based on that there was like there is also some studies that have happened uh, to look at what could be the potential yield so earlier uh, we also did some studies in house uh, but that was done using uh, fairly coarse resolution data like even using landsat and modis uh, it was kind of very difficult because uh, the spectral differences were very uh, sort of narrow and uh, was not very uh, good to kind of differentiate between different crop types but uh, of late we now with the kind of available data sets we are now able to also using different set of vegetation indices as in so no no uh, no longer you are just using sort of a hard classification and just saying okay this is what it is but now we are also using a combination of different indices uh, and using all of that uh, one could have also come up with uh, uh, kind of distinguishing what is happening to that and i'm not sure if somebody presented uh, anything but uh, today we have different tools that are also telling whether what is the soil moisture of that location and things like that so it is uh, like really very useful in that sense uh dr nadesh i'm not sure if i answered your uh, question completely but i'm happy yeah yeah it's okay okay okay, okay. thank you sir thank you sudhir if i need any information i will contact you for sure thank you thank you sudhir thank you nice thank you sir. thank you sir thank you if you have any questions sir kindly ask uh no more questions we will conclude the session okay uh we will yes, we will conclude the pre events of event wgic now i firstly thank bst government of india for giving us an opportunity to organize the pre events i express my gratitude to all the speakers from the government sectors academic and research in industry startups and ngos for spending their valuable time with us and sharing their knowledge and experience and i take this opportunity to thank all the delegates and participants for attending the two day event and hope the knowledge gain would benefit all thank you thank you